Hi there, and welcome to the Utility Sports Podcast. I have Hakeem Valas on with me today, and he was gracious enough to take the time out of his day to do this uh, little interview. Um, first, do you want to kind of give yourself or give the listeners a little background on um, where you came from and your, your path to the NFL? Oh, yeah, no problem. Awesome. Appreciate you having me on the show. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm from New Jersey. I went to a small college called Monmouth University. Uh, I was a bench player primarily uh, my first three years of college. Um, I And I was a wide receiver. In my fourth year, I made the move from wide receiver to tight end. First game of my senior year, I got my first catch. Second game, got my first touchdown. Started every game after that. And then, uh, yeah, came back my fifth year, did my thing again. I mean, finished my college career with only three touchdowns, under 1,000 yards. And uh, made it undrafted to the Arizona Cardinals in 2016. Sure. So you want to kind of talk about how you were able to catch a scout's eye and how that all formulated. Obviously, like the college statistics were not necessarily there, but what really caught their eye? Honestly, for me, you know, I, you know, a lot of teams came through leading up to it. It helped my little brother. He's in the NFL as well. Um, and you know, that DNA kind of helps. And then we had a kid from our school the year before get drafted in the seventh round, Neil Sterling. So mm-hmm. we already had schools coming out. I had the size and what I really had was the speed, um, which is something that lacks more or less in most tight end rooms. Mm-hmm. And it was the week of the draft, the week before the draft, um, had no contact prior with Arizona. They weren't at my pro day. They had no no nothing with them, but their assistant GM pretty much gave me a call and was like, "Look, I've seen every other tight end in this draft class, and I hate them all. But you, I, your 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 film just was on my desk and it caught my eye. Um, he said my son had like a game or something like on the East Coast, so I'm gonna hack it and stop by your school and work you out. And we threw, we had lunch." everything felt amazing and he was just honest with me later on that week was like look love you we're either going to take you in the seventh round or we're going to take you as a free agent and pretty much on the phone with me the whole time like throughout the draft and then seventh round came around he was like look I, I tried to stand on the table for you but we want we're going defense uh for this round and we're just going to keep you on the phone until the draft's over and sure. take you as an undrafted sure. free agent Right, so you're kind of that priority uh, UDFA for them. Uh, did you have yep. any other teams that you were in contact with, or was it just mainly Arizona was, was the go? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of teams. Tampa was – like, I thought I was going to potentially get drafted there, but they wound up drafting a, a fullback. Uh, mm-hmm. They pretty much lied to me, actually. Really? Uh, yeah, I went out to dinner, fancy restaurant by my school with their tight end coach, who also ran my pro day. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, yeah, we want to take you either as a draft pick or afterwards. Um, we're getting rid of the fullback from our offense, which is opening up another tight end position. Sure. We like your type, blah, 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 blah. They wind up drafting the fullback. <laughs> I was just like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was kind of a gut punch. Right. Uh, and then Atlanta was looking heavily. When the seventh round came around, the Redskins were actually about to draft me at the time. And I didn't want them to because like, I really wanted to go to Arizona. And yeah, right. I was convinced that Jordan Reed had just gotten paid all that money mm-hmm. and that it would have just been a, you know, it would, I, would, I would have just been a camp body and wind up getting cut. Who knows how it would have played out, obviously. Right, yeah. Right. Um, but I remember, like, being like, all right, they're about to draft me. Um, but, like, low-key, like, hope they don't because I think I can really make this Arizona team the way the assistant GM kind of explained it out to me. Right. Well, that's awesome that you were able to, to you know, ultimately catch your eye and everything. Um, can you kind of speak on, because you played for two franchises with the Cardinals and the Lions. Can you kind of mm-hmm. speak on the different cultures and how it varied from, from the two teams? Um, so I put the Cardinals, Lions, and I also put the Giants for eight okay. weeks as well. Okay. Um, but yeah, cultures vary. I mean, at the end of the day, NFL is they're they're independent business organizations, um, the teams, and yeah, culture's a little different. Uh, Arizona was the Bidwell. I wouldn't say it was you know it was, it was culture is culture, uh, but like up from top to bottom, you know, the Bidwell family owned the Cardinals, um, 
they were legit, you know, really about the community. I've, I've That's one of my favorite parts when I was on the Arizona Cardinals is all the community service we got to do. Mm-hmm. Every Monday, Tuesday, and probably, I probably like, like you had the opportunity at least three times a week, if you had the time, to do some type of community service, which was really cool. Just some of the, the cool opportunities you got to kind of experience, like mm-hmm. going to the different Air Force bases and shooting guns with some of the some of the service men and women, you know, uh, hosting the uh, opening ceremony of the Special Olympics. Like it was, it was so much, so much cool, like different cool stuff, and so much like I was Santa Claus, and with mm-hmm. Jordan Sparks, and we landed on a helicopter on top of Phoenix Children's Hospital and gave out presents. That's like awesome. that was it was sick. But like that that was off days in Arizona because and but on that like we took the owners helicopter to land on phoenix children's hospital mm-hmm. um and then uh detroit was uh that was the ford family uh, martha ford ran uh ran owned the team still owns the team i think there's something just a shift in ownership just happened like a week or two yeah. ago yep um same thing heavy on the community um definitely financially supported the team heavily you sure. know when matt patricia came in town um all the upgrades that we wanted to have, like it wasn't like a hesitation. Like we had float tanks, we had cryo chambers, we had any and everything after, um, I can't remember what the, uh, who was our sports science dude? I can't remember our sports science dude's name, but hired him who and everything that he wanted, like we got, which is kind of cool. Mm-hmm, for sure. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, a lot of, a lot of it, um, obviously you don't think about those other perks that you have. So it sounds like uh, to you, especially that uh, some of the community service and involvement in the community is important to you. Would you agree? hundred percent. It's, uh, you know, it's cool to have the, the NFL platform. Uh, the coolest part is that the fact that you can make a kids. I remember when I was a kid, I was uh, diehard Eagles fan, mm-hmm. and it's how crazy it is. Like how crazy something like this, a moment like this, can can mean. And I didn't even have the moment. Like my little brother, mm-hmm. the backup long snapper for the Philadelphia Eagles, name was Mike Bartram. I played a little bit of tight end as well. Mm-hmm. Must have been doing some type of community service event, coming to schools, hanging out with kids comes to my little brother's classroom, spends a day, gets a picture, all that stuff. My brother's not even an Eagles fan. But the fact that he got to do that, yeah. the fact that I'm here 20, 15 to 20 years later, telling you that story about this guy, Mark, Mike Bartram, yeah. shows the long-lasting effect of just being a human, just hanging out. And I didn't even get the one-on-one, just right, I'm, but yeah. I'm that diehard of an Eagles fan that the fact that my brother got to experience that with a backup long snapper at the end of the day. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like that's yeah. that, that knowing, uh, knowing that feeling that I could do that or that, that someone could do that to me. And, but now that I actually have that power to do it now, it's empowering. You could use, it's like you can use your powers for good or bad. And it's like you right. can legitimately use your powers for good and just make a whole bunch of kids day over and over and over and over again Mm -hmm. and the beautiful part of this is there's going to be some kid talking about when he met you or he or she met you essentially later on that's the punchline it's all it's all it's all legacy and that's that's where it's like i can it's that same effect and like now how can i make it even more of a lasting effect so this kid always remembers that time when that you know what i mean like that's always a cool feeling when it's like oh hey like years later you saw my son or you you signed this for me or you did this and it's like that's a, it's a really cool feeling yeah for sure i mean that that's great that you're able to have that that kind of outreach to these kids that you know essentially they they just look up to you like as as kids we're always looking at these athletes and and we're glorifying them and it, it's just it's such a cool thing that that you you had that opportunity to do that and continue to do that now something i want to kind of jump to kind of switching gears from the actual league, but kind of life after football for you. Um, the reason, or the way I found you actually was on TikTok. So I thought I, yeah. I should reach out to him. And I, I just want to kind of get your process of how did you start making TikToks? And then all of a sudden, you, you know, you became pretty big on there. I think you're at like 80,000 followers or something. Yeah. So it doesn't just start at TikTok. So I'll, TikTok for me started a month ago. I had 50 followers a month ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
so where it really starts is, you know, retirement. So I'm an entrepreneur at the core. Um, I retired because I had a one-year-old daughter. Not sure it wasn't one at the time, but I had a daughter. And I also was an entrepreneur. And I couldn't, like, because I didn't have a team built out around me, I couldn't be the entrepreneur that I wanted to be. So okay. since retiring, um, I'm a real estate investor. Um, I'm an investor in the cannabis space. And I own a digital, a global media agency called uh, Perspective Global Media. Um, and have 11 employees now and have grown and scaled and got to the point where I can feel comfortable of walking, not walking away from the business, but walking back into playing football. Um, mm -hmm. But being able to remove myself essentially from the business because I've hired more people. When I was playing, I tried to do it all by myself. If you kind of get what sure. I mean. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, how were you able to kind of balance that when you were you were building it up a little bit of football? Yeah, when I was building it, you know, when I was playing, it was just off season. I I, I like January first every season. It was as soon as the season ended, I was doing I was doing something real estate related. I was in another city, moving, shaking, running, trying to make it happen. Um, back to the TikTok question. I I didn't uh, answer your question. As someone who runs a global media agency. I like to be a, you know, a practitioner of all the platforms and where can, where's the attention and how can you take advantage of that attention and how, you know, TikTok, you can hear in one Gary V scream from the bleachers <laughs> of getting on TikTok over and over again. And yep. I had messed around on it before until I gotten 50 followers over, I don't know how long I'd been posting on it. But then I was like, let me actually get serious. Let me, Gary V says, just consume, you know, for, for, if you can consume for five hours on TikTok, do that. And then like in your niche, so instead of doing dancing like everybody thinks you have to do, if you post about real estate, if you post about entrepreneurship, if you post about whatever, mm -hmm. look up those hashtags and look at posts, you know, within those niches, just so you can understand the context of it. And then all I did was repurpose the content that I had already put on Instagram sure. and LinkedIn in the past, but then yep. turned it into nine by 16 format added different contextual words, you know, to it, to make it pop and stuff like that. Yeah. And then that's literally all I did. But then I just, it's I, I, with, with TikTok, I believe it's volume. It's like, vo it's volume of creative. Like how much can you create, but how much volume can you put it out as well and keep testing different stuff. So that, that's kind of what I've been doing. It tested me working out on the field, tested me talking about real estate, t tested me talking about just random entrepreneurship stuff I did, mm -hmm. tested me, talking about a football play i did in the nfl yeah and seeing like how much like what over index is in that sense and it's literally been a month <laughs> like right yeah it's crazy um, it's crazy to I mean, eighty thousand followers in a month um but i honestly, honestly think anybody can do it because it's i mean i don't know how small of it. like if if point right now there's point five percent of people on linkedin post content i know it's way less on tiktok mm -hmm. For sure. 0.5% of 700 million LinkedIn users post content. No, that, that's pretty mind boggling actually. Which is a wild I, number I of its that. own. And thinking about how long LinkedIn is and how many people actually do produce content on it. Mm -hmm. I think TikTok, how many fewer people are posting. Like right. just look at your, audit your followers. Like I audit the people who've been following me. Damn near all of them. None of them have ever posted a video. Some of them right. have, but your average TikToker has not posted a video. You know what I'm saying? And it just leaves a massive opportunity for growth um, if you're posting content at scale. So that's ultimately how it led me to you is posting at scale, trying to learn the, the platform, testing it out. You know, if there's attention somewhere, if I told you you could put whatever you wanted on a billboard, would you put it there for free? You probably would. But if I'm telling you the billboard is the cell phone, why not put your message on the cell phone? Right, exactly. And it costs absolutely nothing to do it. Um, it, it. It just makes sense to post that kind of content. And what kind of, what of the content have you found was the most successful so far for you? Um, the most, most successful was the video of me talking when I had an iPhone repair business when I was in college. I did watch that. Yeah, I, I did. I did come across that one. That was awesome. That's, oh, that one's got like 2.5 2. million views. But then I've got one that's got I don't know, 1.2 at least million views, but just answering a question, a general real estate question to someone who had $60,000, uh, well, make 60,000 a year and whatever their credit score was, could they get a loan for X? Sure, sure. And I just answered that, that did really well. My football ones got a couple of like 700, 
mm-hmm. 500, 100. Some hit, some don't hit, and then some hit like a week later. Like I'll let yeah. it chill, and then all of a sudden my phone goes crazy, and then a video goes from 20,000 views to a half. Like it literally happened, like 20,000 views to like a half a million views in a few hours. And it's just like, it's crazy. So it's like, I think if you're unemotional about it, most people get a little caught up into it. And then once they have a little bit of virality, they change or they try and stick to that one thing. Like I've been, like I told like my, my biggest video was an iPhone video and I've been posting football videos lately. Right. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, it's just, it, it's just testing as like, if you can post five times a day, you should no matter, like I wouldn't say no matter what you do, but mm-hmm. you can figure out something. Right, exactly. I, I think that's a great point. Um, thank you for answering that. I kind of want to shift to something that um, I came actually across on, on your content talking about financial literacy for players. Would you like to kind of speak again on, on your, your take on, you know, how the NFL should maybe do a better job and on teaching some of these players when they get in the league how to handle their money? And are there programs in place that essentially, you know, give them an opportunity to learn? uh there's optional programs uh when you're a rookie you go to a you go through like a financial uh you have like a financial advisor or somebody budgeting person kind of come and uh talk to you at the end of the day after you've been working and grinding all day and you're tired most half of the room is sleeping through it Mm -hmm. um i think the league could do better with pairing players with the people in different industries um with the brand and the massive amount of connections that a team has there's yeah. no telling that if like every player should be talked to and asked what do you like like what do you like to do i think a lot of people financial literacy is one thing but painting a picture is another painting a picture of if you handle your money right this is what you could become or who you could become when you're done playing Sure. You know what I mean? Like yeah, you don't, you're not just a football player in this sense. You know, you're a human who might have passions and talents in other spaces as well. So I think that, I don't know, if you're the Dallas Cowboys, Dallas Cowboys should have every and any connection in every industry in Dallas. If I wanted to, if I'm an NFL, if I play for the Dallas Cowboys and I want to get into the cannabis industry, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a police officer, I want to be in the FBI, I want to be a real estate investor, I want to be a freaking person who cremates bodies i don't know Mm -hmm. i want to be one of those people i should be able to and it's it's doable to do it yourself but you know something that the nfl could proactively do is make sure that each player at some point is paired with somebody amongst their passion do you know Mm -hmm. what i mean i want to be a developer i want to be an investor i want to do whatever the hell you want to do Mm -hmm. i think that instead of like high levels trying to teach people stuff I think you need to be out in the field and spend the day, spend the afternoon on a site of with a real estate developer. Spend the afternoon on the site. Say you want to be a, you want to actually grow cannabis. Spend the afternoon with a grower. You know what I mean? Say you want to be the CEO of a Fortune 100 company. You should be able to shadow the CEO of any Fortune 100 company. Right in your city, if you're on the Dallas Cowboys, you know what I'm saying? Right. Like, right. But mm-hmm. that picture isn't painted, and it's when most players are done when they're trying to get some of those types of opportunity, but they're they don't have that same leverage when they're done playing. Sure. So you know, speaking on the idea of a player when they're done, um, is there anything that the NFL does to you know try to try to push them a certain direction or try to help them out, or do they kind of get cut off? as soon as they're no i mean there's 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 programs there's it's been pro- proactive but there's programs there's fairs there's pretty much you can decide what you're you can have a conversation with somebody and uh I'm, i i haven't done it but I'm, i i believe that they really will help you and like walk like hold your hand through that process of kind of your your transition to your next phase mm-hmm. right exactly. but i i've never went through the program so I don't, I don't know yeah for sure yeah it's good to know that they do have some things in place but i mean obviously you feel like you could do definitely a better job and in, in transitioning some of those guys um which, which is you know definitely something that they should look into considering you know how powerful they are and how much of an outreach that they have with all these different businesses and um relationships they have so 100 percent. i definitely agree um, kind of transitioning back into football, just this is kind of more a fun question here for you. Who was one guy when you got into the league that you you were just, 
in awe of seeing or meeting or working with? It's crazy because it's the second time I've blanked on his name. And it's pissing me off. Played offensive lineman, Arizona Cardinals, went to Bama, older dude, played but played for the Eagles back in the day. Okay. Can't remember his freaking name. But I remember seeing him day one. And I don't know why I can't remember his name. Mm-hmm. I remember seeing him day one, like – you got Larry Fitzgerald, Pat Peterson, Tyron Matthew. Like, you got some big time dudes in Arizona. Mm-hmm. And literally, the person I was most starstruck by was the ex Philadelphia Eagles because I grew up such a die hard Eagles fan. Yeah. Like, even in Detroit, like, I, I was the most starstruck person that, like, in Detroit was our assistant offensive line coach, was Hank Fraley, who was an offensive lineman for the Eagles back in the day. Mm-hmm. And, like, that's the cool, like, the, like he's one of the lower coaches on the totem pole because he's right. a younger newer and like to me he's a, literally a freaking god like <laughs> starstruck like every time like holy crap that's hank fraley right yep like every day right i'm sure you know like when you when you grow up watching the eagles and everything like you definitely glorify these guys and you have a hundred percent and yep. it's like oh then there's matt stafford and then, you know what I mean? But it's like that doesn't <laughs> like it's not even not even kind of close. Yeah, like, Larry, meeting Larry Fitzgerald for the first time versus meeting Hank Fraley, <laughs> not even close. Tyron, like I said, Tyron, Pat, all these OGs, Carson Palmer, mm-hmm. not, like nothing compared to like meeting Hank Fraley. Sure. Now I got to ask you real quick: Who is your favorite quarterback to work with? Now that you brought up some of these names. Uh, Matt Stafford, definitely Matt Stafford, just because I probably put, I just put in more work with him um, mm-hmm. versus Carson, like experience wise, definitely Stafford. I, and I, I connected with Stafford well. We were, we were, I, I really liked him as a person on and off the field. Mm-hmm. Cool, cool. Well, and I then think... we put in like off, oh, my bad. Oh, no, 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 go ahead. I was just saying, we put in like off season work and stuff like that. It was, uh, it was a solid, solid connection there. Did you have a pretty good relationship off the field and everything too? Did you do like a bad side of, Okay, cool. Um, you know, I think I think that's good for today. Um, I appreciate you having you on here, and uh, you know, hopefully in the future we can maybe reconnect and, and do another one of these. Hundred percent, bro. All right.